All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Uh, today's railroad that will be covered in Fallen Flags of America is the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, originally chartered in 1850 to run from Louisville, Kentucky to Nashville, Tennessee. It was a railroad that had trackage from Louisville, Kentucky, I think at its peak all the way down to, I want to say Atlanta and parts of parts of Mississippi. It ran from Kentucky, um, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, parts of Louisiana, I believe to New Orleans. And it also had many different tracks, which one of which of its many tracks, which I will discuss a little bit in depth of today, was its tra its um, old road branch, which was a connecting track that ran from Lexington, Kentucky, actually from Louisville, Kentucky, to Lexington, Kentucky, and it ran through what is now this of the old rare the old road division of the RJ Corman Railroad, specifically the Central Kentucky portion. Um because RJ Corman has many different branches as it extends into many different states, but that's a different video. Um I believe some of the famous trains on the L and M were the Hummingbird, the uh Floridian may have been one. Um, that may have been ACL, actually. Um, the Pan American, which is one of its very famous trains. Um, but yeah, that was really about it. The L&M was also a very interesting railroad, as it, um, in its early days, it was only... 250 miles, I do believe. It was a very short railroad. And it also ran a mix of interesting power because it operated with a heavy amount of EMDs, General Electrics, and a handful of Alco locomotives throughout its years. Um, now, this picture right here was taken in 6573. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. 6573, so it would have been short. Amtrak would have been only a year old at this point. Um, here we see General Electric's. General Electric, I want to say these may have been U 25 C's or U 30 C's. I'm not sure, but they do have what I call the box fans on them which was referring to where they didn't have a curved shape. They looked more like a box, the side of a cardboard box. You know how it's flat, and it only goes straight up, and then it goes the other way across, but flat. Uh, modern General Electrics kind of have a curved shape to their fans on the side. These didn't back then. Um, anyhow, these two... With 1532 and 1525 leading, well, trailing, um, they lead train 163, which appears to be a manifest at first glance, or a general freight, um, past a very old siding, which I'm not sure what it was used for, but it tells me it's been abandoned for a long time, If even back in the days of L&N it was abandoned, and nope, this was in 73, so... By then, traffic was starting to deteriorate on the L and N, and one of the longest-standing railroads in America was finally going into um, not bankruptcy, but it wasn't doing so well. Um, one of the notable things that happened on the L and M was in 1960, it absorbed one of its compete competing roads, the NC and STL Railroad, also known as the Dixie Line Railroad. Um, it had controlled this railroad as a subsidiary for many years before this, but it was fully merged in 1960. Um, and another picture of l and is seen here. Um, l and 900, which was one of very few GP-18s to be rushed from l and taken in 71072. Um, these... 
rebuilt Jeeps, which essentially looks to me like a Jeep 9 with a chopped nose on it. Uh, there's not really much differences other than that. They were really just rebuilt from GP7s or 9s that had been built in 1950 or maybe the early 60s. Um, this was actually taken on an abandoned portion of the L&N. Well, not really the L&N. It was a local railroad that connected to the L&N, but I'll do that one in another video, but there's not really much to tell on it. So I'm tempted to do it in this video, but I won't. It appears here it was also fresh out of works at this point. You can see that even on the axles, it looked pretty fresh on the paintwork. See, it only had a, just a light touch of grime on its front trucks, but it was very nice looking other than that. It may have been one of the class leaders of this new series of locomotives. This is another picture of l and n and a lot of people will find this one interesting as um, I have often seen from groups on the internet that not too many pictures of black l and n especially E or F units, can be found, and I am just showing you that this is one of very few, I would say probably e -A -E -S -E 6A, excuse me, that can be displayed in the L&M black. This is a particularly rare paint scheme. Um, I'm not sure why, I guess probably because it wasn't found very attractive on passenger units, which would make sense. Um, but this was probably taken in the days just before L&M probably quit running passenger trains out of Louisville because by probably the early 70s they were beginning to question if they should still operate Louisville as a station. And it's sad to say that most of it when the passenger trains quit and the steam era quit, Louisville was not nearly as big as it once was for the L&N. I mean at one time they had I think actually I think they were used until maybe the seaboard era days when you had the family lines and the seaboard system was created, which was a merger between the seaboard system and the L and N. That's when you had family lines. Although that only existed for right about ten years before CSX came about. Anyway, back to my topic here. Uh this paint scheme for unknown reasons quite honestly was just very rare but you can also see that there's a a pair of e of probably some more they look like e8a's but they are in the traditional l and n gray and yellow but i don't think i have managed to dig up any other pictures of units in this paint scheme. You can see that down, it, have the, it have the streamlined plow. Um, it did have the gyro light displayed. And it had the headlight displayed. It had, They did use marker lights for l and I don't remember when exactly they quit using them. I want to say they may have used them until CSX on the l and um, it, this unit actually displays two logos on the l and It displays the traditional just text logo, which is the Louisville and Nashville, and then it displays the famous yellow and red l and logo, both on the front plow and on the side of the cab. Um, I don't really... Oh... For those of you who may not be old enough to remember, back then units had two tanks on them if they were passenger units. They had what would be called the fuel tank, which is where they kept the diesel fuel for the locomotive. Then they'd have a second tank, and it was a very small tank, almost like a beach ball sometimes. That was the water tank for the steam generator. And back in the day, what would happen is that before you had electric heating on passenger cars, 
you have locomotives that did it and how that would work is that they would put water in it and then when it got really cold outside they would um, activate that water and get it real hot and then it would turn into steam and that would be your heating that's how that would work but by the time that whoops by the time that um, Amtrak came along this was already obsolete so there was no need to use it so that was why that didn't really last too much longer but the L&N I think its final year was in 1973 when it was finally decided that after probably over two decades of operating it um, was merged with the seaboard system which created family lines and then as you know in 1986 that was when CSX was created between the merger of family lines and the Chessie system which was composed of the CNO, BNO and Western Maryland railroads. Uh, there's not really a lot I can tell about the L N since I wasn't really around to remember it, but thankfully there have been several L N M locomotives that have been preserved throughout. Um, I don't know about America, but I do. I do know that um, I live very close to the Kentucky State Railroad Museum located in New Haven, Kentucky, which if I recall correctly, has a LNN GP9 that they preserved and is still operating. They also have a bit of an unrelated locomotive here, but they have a Santa Fe uh, CF7 that is preserved and they still use. And also LNN uh, 152, which is one of my favorite steam locomotives, which is a... I think it's a light Pacific, if I remember right, um, but it's been undergoing an overhaul for a little while now, and I remember one time when I was there a little while ago, it, when it was still in the shops and they had everything taken off, um, one of the employees there actually gave me a piece of the original steam piping, because he was very kind to me, and so I kept that with me, and to this day, I have it, and it's kind of special to me because it's not every day you get a piece of original steam tubing out of an old locom out of a fifty-plus-year-old locomotive, which I think was built in the Roger Locomotive Works, if I'm not mistaken, which I think was later acquired by Alco. But I will do that in another video on what I learned about that, but. The light Pacifics on L&M, most of them I do believe were built in the early 19-teens to 1920s. Um, they were designed originally for passenger service because they had the large drivers. Um, if I recall right, they came in a 260. No, wait, that's a... No? No? No, I think they were a 460. That might that is a Pacific, if I remember right. Um, but yeah, they were attended for passenger service, and before um, Louisville actually was also used as a joint station because, as I told you, but for many years before it was fully merged, the Dixie Line was actually a subsidiary of the L N much like the Illinois Central is with Canadian National or the West the Wisconsin Central of Canadian National. Like you'll see Canadian National units, like some of them will have B and C in paint and they'll have like their predecessor roads on them like IC or WM or uh if you're on Canadian Pacific D and H stuff like that. It also was a thing on Comrail because they had uh, some locomotives, actually NS rather, that most of the SC70s especially had this. They would say like um, 
com well PRR or Comrail, which would be CR or PRR or NS. Um, I do believe that some of the C thirty nine dash eights on NS when they were still building them long and forward, some of them had Southern on them. They were an NS paint, um, SOU. Uh, but yeah, there's not really much else I can talk about. It appears on this L&N locomotive, it probably had a RS3L of some kind, or, excuse me, or a, um, a Hooter, well not a, a A200, um, Leslie A200, I think, which was a horn that was just really a loud and long horn, and then you have the RS3Ls, which were used on a variety of railroads, um, maybe an RS5T of some kind, but I don't know. L&N did use, I do believe they used some RS-5Ts of several different variants. They may have used a few of the RS-3Ls as variants, which are, you don't know what we're talking about. I'm talking about air horns, so they could have used A200s like on the FTs or the F3s or the F units or some of the early E units like E6As or some E8As. Um... Jeep 9s may have had them. Jeep 7s probably had them. If LNN had any, maybe SC7s. I don't really know. But uh, the LNN also, one of my favorite colors, and I don't have it but on here, but also one of my favorite colors that they have was the um, E8As they had in the 1950s and they came in there as delivered. Uh, blue, cream, and red scheme. That was a beautiful paint scheme, I think. Um, there's an E8A, I do believe, that sits in Bowling Green, Kentucky, along um, one of the CSX tracks that is preserved with a U.S. Um, a post office car, basically a mail car, and I think a coach with it, and they are all preserved on static display, but the E8 is showing a little bit of its age a little bit, and there's not really anything to be done on that because if it sits outside and it just sits in the weather and eventually rusts, there's not really anything that can be done. I mean, an example of this is that... Um, if you ever have visited the Horseshoe Curve at Pennsylvania and you see the GP7 there, if you look on some of the pictures of it, sometimes you can see the bl it looks like the black is rusted over and it's just because it's sat outside for so long. It's just not really good. And I really don't understand why they replaced a... I want to say what may have been a prairie that they had sitting there back in the Comrail days, or maybe it was even the Pensy days. I don't know, but they had they had a steam locomotive that was on static display sitting there, and then by the time Comrail came around, I think they replaced it with an old diesel. I just don't understand it, but it is the way it is. Now I myself have never never visited Horseshoe Curve, but um, yeah, that's really all I've got on the story of the L&N. Um, it was one of my favorite railroads of Kentucky. Uh, it also, I should mention, was a huge, and I mean huge, employer of railroad workmen in Kentucky and to all of those of who have worked on the L&N if you're watching this video thank you for uh working and keeping the railroad al keeping L&N alive and preserving it for so long for everyone to see and learn about in the future and I would assume it just would have been amazing to work on the L&N just have the knowledge that when you're I guess now that 
you used to work on one of the biggest railroads in America and one of the oldest in America too. And also a thing about the L&N, and this is not to be critical, but it was also very aggressive because when you came to getting roots from the L&M, they were very difficult to overcome just because that was how they were. They did what they had to do to keep business sur to survive, and I really respect that. The same thing, I think that was probably what made them last as long as they did before either getting merged into somebody or bought out by somebody or just going under in some way or another. Um... But yeah, Louisville actually used to be a huge yard. It had a station down in Louisville. I, I'm not sure where this is, but what I do know is that I think in the background to where my mouse is, I can zoom in with it, this building here very likely was the corporate office for L&M because they have what's called the L&M Tower in Louisville. And it was the tower in Louisville where the L&N, and they had a huge sign up there on the top of it that stood for many years. And I think it's still there, but I'm not sure. Um, it was basically there, I think it was their na national office where they had all their employees working. That was where you had all the office people and just stuff working in the corporate scene of the railroad. Because in the railroad you would have either the corporate scene, which would be people who work business and just getting things worked out, and then you'd have the people who were working the hands-on side of the railroad, which were doing more of driving the trains or fixing the locomotives or repairing them or putting new parts on them or in some cases rebuilding them, but I don't really think L&N, and I could be wrong, but I don't think L&N uh, had a program where they rebuilt their Jeeps most of the time because I don't know if when they, they had their old Jeeps, and this would have been by probably the late 60s since they're, they were getting old, I don't know if they survived into the seaboard era or if they were scrapped or if they were rebuilt and I it's hard to say but I do know that there is a large quantity just because they were a popular unit the well popular locomotive these three the GP10 16 and 18s which were all different variants rebuilt from both the GP9 and the GP7 which were the same unit, except the GP9 was only a little bit more powerful. And it was the same with the SD9s and SD7s, except they were six axles as opposed to four axle units. And both could run long hub forward, except you could get better tractive effort out of a four axle unit. Um... But this right here, I think, would have been probably one of the sand tanks for the unit. I'm not sure what this would have been for. These are the, um, I think, radiator um, covers all down through there. But uh, I think Amtrak only served Louisville for a very short time because they, I think it, they actually quit running in Louisville in the mid-80s, I think. Um, but yeah, they didn't really do much else because they had a mail train that ran out of Louisville or brought mail to Louisville, but due to really taxpayers in the city of Louisville not liking it, that train was discontinued, that ended up... Funny enough, being the last train of the books on Amtrak to run, run out of Louisville or through Louisville, I think it ran from Louisville to Cincinnati or maybe from Louisville to Cincinnati, which was just across the river. It was a very short leg. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if at one time Amtrak actually had trains running through Cincinnati down south to Louisville probably you could get a train back then for a certain amount of money. You could go from Louisville to Chicago and you could 
get on the train in Louisville and go up to Chicago and then get get the same train back and go to Louisville and it'd just be I would think that would have been a profitable route for them. I really don't see why they abandoned that route, but they did what they did. And then when CSX didn't have any interest in keeping it up, they just abandoned it, and it was eventually built over. And I'd say by now, all of this stuff where this picture is probably is no longer there, unfortunately, except for the station. It was the only building to be preserved because if you look on Google Maps on where the station was, everything around it is roads or buildings. It's just, Louisville is a massive city. Another st another example of that is that over at the airport, there used to be two uh, farm equipment plants. One was International Harvester, the other was Avery, and after that it became Minneapolis Moline which was rebranded as a B.F. Avery Moline. Um, but when those plants closed, I want to say in the early 70s, they may have closed, the airport actually bought the land where they were and built, o built over them, and you couldn't see anything unless you knew exactly where to look. I mean, they're hard to find. I myself have had trouble looking for them, but I've actually found them, uh, or parts of where they would have stood, because if you look, you can see some flat ground there that would have been the foundation for where they would have been, but this is supposed to be centered around trains, well, actually, it's centered around history in Kentucky, so I guess that works, but, um, yeah, Anyway, guys, that's going to wrap up this video. If you enjoy, please be sure to like the video and comment down below. And don't forget to hit it. So uh, don't forget to, if you're not already subscribed, don't forget to hit that notification bell as it lets you know the second I upload a new video just like these so you can hear more of it. And if you'd like to, to subscribe, it's free. Uh, it doesn't cost you nothing. There's no year, there's nothing to it. You can just hit the bell, hit the button, and you're subscribed. And you can have the notifications on, or you can have them off, or you can have them personalized, which means you'll just get some, but not all of them. And if you want to subscribe, it's always free. So, anyways, guys, that's gonna do it for this video from L and M Productions. I hope you enjoy this little historic, nostalgic talk video thing on uh, Fallen Flags of America. And until next time, I will see you guys later. Anyways, guys, have a good one. I'll see you later. Have a good one. Bye.